We're talking today with Larry Grothheis of Byron Center, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Now, Larry, can you start out with some background on yourself uh, to start out with uh, where and when were you born? Okay, I was born in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, the first one of uh, seven children to be born in a hospital, uh, Butterworth Hospital on Michigan Street. And I grew up in okay. Grand Rapids. And what, what year were you born? I was born in 1943. Okay. Anyway, uh, lived there uh, up through the eighth grade, and then my parents uh, joined the flight to the suburbs. Uh, but we lived near the area of Franklin and Granville Avenue. That was home for many years. All right. Now, uh, what did your father do for a living? My father was a produce trucker. Uh, he peddled produce uh, to the restaurants and hospitals and stores uh, south of Holland down to South Haven. And that's, that was his job. And was he doing that during the Second World War or did he have to be in the Army? Uh, no, I was the one that kept him out. And during that time, uh, he, was, uh, he did drive truck for a wholesale distributor and he also uh, the stories are here, he peddled milk, and he also hauled butter in a truck for L.V. Everhart before he got all these stores. <laughs> all right. Uh, then, uh, let's see, where did you go to school? Uh, up through the eighth grade, I went to Southwest Christian School, which is Clyde, Clyde Park in uh, Granville Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I told you my parents joined the flight to the suburbs, right. and they moved out to the Granville Jemison area. Mm -hmm. So I ended up uh, going to Hudsonville Unity Christian mm -hmm. and graduated in 1961. All right. Now, once you uh, graduated from high school, what were you going to do? Okay. Uh, I wanted to get into business. I loved accounting. Uh, it was easy for me. So uh, I went to Davenport University for a few years and uh, finished that. And uh, then I, I took a job with a wholesale distributor on the north end of Grand Rapids. Uh, called the Victor S. Barnes Company, which still is active today. And uh, I worked in the office and then traveled and uh, I met her. Uh, and uh, yeah, things clicked pretty good. And, uh, okay. So uh, now did you take a four-year degree at Davenport? Or no, that was a, in those years, uh, two years, mm -hmm. and the Vietnam War was siphoning off all the young men, so I had five job offers getting out of school which today the kids would just uh, love, see? And times are different. All right. Now, uh, so when did you finish at Davenport then? Uh, that would be in 1964. Okay. Now, while you were in college, did you have a deferment because of that, or you just, because you're eligible for the draft at that point otherwise? Well, I had to register in Ottawa County, mm -hmm. uh, and of course I was classified 1A, but uh, the draft never was really any big thing. And then uh, when we started talking marriage, uh, JFK passed a law that the, they will not draft any married men. And that was fine. That made us more secure. And uh, we were married, and uh, we bought a piece of land between Jenison and Allendale and was going to build a house and someday start a family. Well, uh, laws are made and laws are changed. And uh, they ended up changing that law. I think Johnson's administration did that. So uh, anyway, but no problem. I would stop at the draft board monthly in Grand Haven because I was registered in Iowa County. And the ladies said, oh, man, we got a big stack. We got a big stack. Well, I came in October of 1966. And I walked in, and I says, uh, how are we set? And she says, I think you'll go next month. And I says, are you serious? Yes. So I went home and told her, and in a couple of weeks, uh, there come the papers. Okay. Greetings. Now, at this stage, the way the draft worked was that different states and then localities would get quotas or numbers of men they had to come up with, and the draft boards locally had some ability to decide who went and who didn't. Was that still in place for you? Uh, in terms of a deferment, if you were in college yet, or if you were in teaching, you had a deferment. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was for Michigan. And I had friends uh, from other parts of the states, United States, mm -hmm. they just simply, they were drafted. So uh, anyway, uh, there was uh, in October or November 
in December of 68, 60, 66, six, yeah. there was an unusually large call from Ottawa and Kent County, and uh, my luck ran out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I received a letter, greetings, you are hereby uh, ordered for induction into the armed forces and blah, 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 and all that. And uh, so uh, I left with a whole group of guys, I think, I think 50 of them. We filled a Greyhound bus at the old armory in Grand Haven, and a little ceremony, and of course, being out of a county, they gave us a little Bible to take along, and it talked to us about reading that every day, and of course, those days you could do that, see. So anyway, off to the bus to Detroit, and from Detroit uh, to Fort Knox. And, uh, now, what sort of reception did you get when you got to Fort Knox? Well, when we pulled up, we pulled into the fort in the afternoon, and the bus driver said, well, guys, you got about 30 seconds of laughter left. So we, uh, the bus stopped at the reception center, and a man jumped on with a uniform. He said, you've got five seconds to get off this bus, and it all started. Well. You know, I've been around the block a little in my business, and I said, yeah, these guys, you know, they're just intimidating. And some of the young, innocent guys in there, man, they, they were just feared this sergeant. Terrible, see? So anyway, yeah, we got off the bus, and uh, life began anew. And uh, uniforms and shots and tests and tests and more tests. Now, uh, were you kind of the old guy in the group, or were there other men of about your age? As strange you should ask that, but yes, I was uh, uh, over 23 years of age, and uh, after a while it became uh, fairly evident that the uh, NCOs would say when they needed somebody, and there were others like me, they would pick the older, more mature men. Yeah, they would, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who was just out of high school. Yeah. And what kind of shape were you when you went in? Well, uh, you know, in high school I was not an athlete, but pretty good shape. Uh, and uh, I worked on my feet all day uh, in high school and college. But then you got into a desk job and things happen. And uh, then you travel in a car all day and things happen. So uh, probably at best medium shape, and, uh, but that all changed in eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, how easy or hard was it for you to make the adjustment to military life? Uh, well, one of the uh, things we had coming up, and I went into November of 66, we had Thanksgiving coming up, and we had Christmas coming up. So, you know, my mind says, listen, they're not going to keep us here over Christmas. So, and I anticipated that. So anyway, but... Um, we were at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and running up and down those hills in physical training and, uh, uh, you know, qualifying at the rifle range. And the guys from Ottawa County, a lot of them were pheasant hunters and deer hunters, and uh, we had some pretty decent shots mm -hmm. in there. So uh, anyway, uh, when I got done with the eight weeks, I was in excellent physical shape. And uh, then they shipped me to uh, cross the tracks to radio school. But in the meantime, they hadn't let you go home for Christmas. Oh, okay. Well, yes. Uh, I'm glad you reminded me of that. Yes, on uh, the day before Thanksgiving, uh, I got a notice that we were going to get three weeks leave at Christmas time. Oh, I got to call home. So I called her on Thanksgiving Day and said, hey, I'm going to be home for Christmas. And uh, that was very good news because we haven't seen each other. Uh, well, yeah, she did stop. She could come down on weekends if I if I had a pass, mm -hmm. and so I did everything to make sure I got a pass. <laughs> so, anyway, but uh, she and a friend of hers from uh, Hudsonville uh, drove uh, 400 miles down and uh, left Friday, uh, Saturday morning, uh, maybe one in the morning, and they drove down to Fort Knox. And uh, after inspections and all the Saturday junk you have to go through. Ah, we had uh, the rest of the day and we had Sunday off. And that was kind of nice to see your wife once a week, so that, uh, you know, helped, uh, helped things along emotionally. Right, okay. And well, then you did get actually the three weeks of Christmas. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you, but you, then you stay then at Fort Knox. I for, Fort for the Knox next day for, for the training. A, for, uh, supposed to be for another eight weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 
we didn't realize that we're going to take the top 5% of the class and make radio teletype operators. So, um, uh, you know, I got to go out for formation. There was about 10 of us from the class. And uh, they said, uh, tomorrow morning you get up at uh, so many zero something hours and you're going to get on a bus and you're going down to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Oh, shoot, taking me way away from my honey back home. Well, uh, so that happened. I got to Georgia. I think it was like uh, Easter weekend. And uh, so we got, uh, ended up, she came to live with me down there and we got permission to live off post so I could drive in in the morning, drive back home at night, just like a regular job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, trained more in the uh, radio teletype skill. And then also the last two weeks we were sent, uh, we were put in the cage called, and that was to learn cryptology. And that's what I did probably through my whole Explain a little bit for a lay audience kind of the mechanics is a radio teletype. I mean, what does, that's not going to mean much to a 16 year old. So what exactly was yeah, that? So, How did it work? Well, see, the radio was either by voice talking over the mic or it was by Morse code with a code key. That was your radio teletype. Mm -hmm. And I learned that at Fort Knox. You see, well, when we got to Fort Gordon, Georgia, we learned how to tune up these big angry 26 radios inside a big van on the back of a deuce and a half and we would crank them up and then we would start typing and send messages back and forth mm -hmm. and then uh, I can talk about it now but I, back then I couldn't after I got out of the army but there was a gray box and we had to set the different buttons in there to the code of the day mm -hmm. and uh, that's what Fort uh, Gordon was all about okay. in the cage and I had to take an oath of secrecy I got a mm -hmm. top secret clearance and uh, all that goes along with that. Okay. Uh, now, how long was the stint at Fort Gordon? Fort Gordon was, I'm, I'm thinking, six or seven weeks. Okay. And then I graduated all the pomp and circuit, the parade, all that. We call it Mickey Mouse stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I got shipped out to a place called Fort Huachuca, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere. You wouldn't want to run away. You wouldn't want to go AWOL because there was, you either had to go to Mexico or you were out in the desert with the copper mines and and all the uh, things. But uh, so I got there and uh, my wife followed me out there from Fort Gordon. She drove over there with a friend of hers, Judy McDonald. Uh, they traveled to Interstate 10 uh, from, uh, I think, uh, from New Orleans uh, all the way to uh, Texas. It took forever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so they ended up almost to Tucson and uh, we found a house there to live in off base. And it was just like a civilian job, you know, uniform, everything, going in the morning. And then she would go to work. She got a job in the bank. It all worked out, and that was good till the end of 1967. And right. what was the nature of the training you were getting at Wachuca, or was this now an active duty stage? Well, it was an active duty stage, what we call permanent party. Okay. So, you know, lots of times it was just guard duty and uh, polishing your shoes and working on equipment and uh, just not doing anything what I considered constructive but to hone your skills mm -hmm. and that's what we did and, and most of the guys lived in a barracks but us married ones, the ones whose wives were down there, we lived off mm -hmm. uh, in a town called Huachuca City which was trailer parks and right. one grocery store and one bar. Right. But were you still then doing the, the teletype? Yes. Oh, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. That is part of mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then that ends when? Well, uh, we uh, had a uh, formation early one morning and the colonel of the uh, battalion and the uh, brigade commander and the company commander, they were all out there and they said we are on orders to go to Southeast Asia, APO 96308, and that we would be leaving approximately some time. So, uh, you know, at the time Nancy lived with me, she became pregnant and we were very happy with that. But then when I got that orders, uh, well, um, yeah. So anyway, things progressed. We, uh, I got leave for a few days to take her home before Christmas. And the day after Christmas, we uh, 
Yeah, I'll never forget how all the relatives are at the uh, Kent County Airport and uh, hugs and uh, see you, maybe. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and uh, you know, you're feeling about like a dish rag at that time. I got to Tucson and we became acquainted with a small church there similar to the Western Michigan culture. Mm -hmm. And we made friends and there was a fellow from the church waiting to pick me up by the name of Jerry Minkville, he and his wife. And I said, I'm surprised to see you. He said, well, I want to take you to the fort. It was a 60 mile drive. And, uh, he, and then, so he did and he dropped me off and he said, uh, now two things. He said, because uh, he was probably 20 years old at the time, he says, you know, right home take a lot of pictures, and stay strong in your faith. Well, I didn't realize how much that was going to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, he dropped me off, and uh, I couldn't call her because they stopped all the outgoing. And so in a couple days, we left uh, about 1 in the morning because all troop movements are at night. And we flew to Tucson, and then from Tucson, we flew to Long Beach, California. Now, were you going as a unit or just as a group of individuals? The whole unit, okay. which was nice. Very nice, because I knew all the guys, and our wives knew each other, you know, and they would write each other, and so that was one comforting thing. I wasn't going into, as one person in a, into a strange area. So uh, we got on a boat called the USS Upshur, and uh, that boat, I'm just going to, i got to wipe a little tear, so you pardon me, folks, if I get a little emotional. But, uh, and uh, we took off from... Long Beach, went by the Queen Mary and uh, Santa Catalina Island. Now what kind of boat was it that you were on? That was a troop ship. Okay. And all that you hear about troop ships is uh, real. Uh, there were bunks stacked up six high, and I happened to be second from the bottom, which was nice, and you hung all your bag and baggage, you know, your big packs, all your uniforms and your rifles, without live ammunition, you were there. And that's where we, it took us a couple weeks to go to Okinawa. And we stopped briefly, uh, we couldn't get off, and then we left Okinawa. And it was getting steadily warmer, and we'd sit out on the deck, you know, just t-shirts or shirtless, you know, and uh, soaking it all up. And of course, I was writing every day to occupy my time, playing cards, making new friends, because there was a company of Marines on the boat, and uh, another engineer's company was on the boat, and we knew we were all headed. So. Uh, and we got uh, one morning, uh, we got up on deck early and we're looking, and then we changed course. We could just feel the ship turning, and then we looked over and there was a big destroyer escort for us. We were getting into closer to Vietnam and uh, maybe hostile territory as far as we knew. And then we uh, ended up uh, debarking from uh, in a place called Quinh Yan, which is a uh, coastal city. And from there, we convoyed with live ammunition. This was, this was surreal. And uh, we convoyed through these mountain passes to the town of An K, A N K H E. All right. Now, I want to back up here a little bit. What did you know about Vietnam and what was going on there before you actually got in country? Well, um, I learned that there were a lot of skirmishes, no big front lines or uh, big bases or anything that was kind of, uh, I, I, somebody said during the Khrushchev area, brush, brush fire wars. Mm -hmm. And that's what I knew about it. And uh, that's the way we entered country. Mm -hmm. And what understanding did you have of, of why we were there in the first place? Well, we, uh, my recollection is that the United States was trying to gain a military victory. Uh, I think uh, the domino theory may ring, uh, ring just, but anyway, the theory was, you know, if Vietnam fell, then this, then they all would fall, and then we would lose our place of power in Southeast Asia. You know, and then next would be the Philippines. So that, that was the mentality, I believe, of the administration, and of course, uh, uh, Robert McNamara was Secretary of State, and uh, he always said, "Well, you know, if we get a hundred thousand more troops, we can, we can win this." Well, you know, so anyway, so we uh, that that was our deal mm -hmm. 
going into Vietnam, but uh, let's, you got live ammunition, you're driving a, a truck through these mountain passes, a paved road, and you're seeing, uh, you know, the people with the pointed hats and the black clothes, and they're waving at you, or they're giving you the finger, you know, uh, depending, so we're saying, well, let's not cause any problems here. Mm -hmm. And I had one fella, a good friend from the Upper Peninsula, his vehicle stalled. Now, when you're in a convoy, the rule is you don't stop to help. You just keep going, and I, I will never forget the look on his face, because there he sits with mountains on each side, and he's there alone driving a vehicle with another fellow. And all they got is these little M16s. So, uh, but we kept going, and finally uh, the wrecker picked him up, and he got to NK where we were going. All right. Uh, now, how would you, uh, this, what kind of base or facility was there at NK? Oh, listen. This was uh, something uh, we got there, and at time, at that time, there was a brigade of the 82nd Airborne. All well, those guys are tough, and the 101st. Well, hey, they'll do all the fighting for you. Well, um, but see, that all changed during Tet, and so the first thing we got to Anke, and we were fed a meal of steak as much as we could eat because we were eating ship's food, which mm -hmm. is. It's, it's nutritious, but it's yuck. Now, about when was this in terms of a date? Were you still... Uh... Uh, this was in January of 68. Okay. So if you, if you can yeah. get the time... Just, uh, yeah, just, uh, just about right before Tet. At that well, uh, Tet was starting to happen. We were okay. getting the ship's newspaper and uh, on K and, and anyway. So uh, in uh, the first night there, we sustained a rocket and mortar attack. Mm -hmm. I think our CO went bonkers because, you know, he was concerned about his men. Well, uh, we had to get all our clothes on and our gear and get in the bunker. Well, later on, you become smart and you just head for that bunker with your rifle, whether you're just in your underwear because, uh, you know, your clothes aren't going to help you. So you, you smarten up fast. And uh, we were there for about two weeks and see our initial mission, as we understood it, was to support the first air cav with communications mm -hmm. in the 101st and the Marines. Well, the 1st Air Cav and the 101st all moved up north to Camp Jali or to Dong Ha or to Fubai. So in two weeks, we followed them up there. We flew in at night and we took over um, the, uh, the barracks, but there we called them hooches. They were just uh, roofs with screened in sides and a plywood floor, elevated. And the Marines had to move out into tents, and there was a lot of tension there. There was a, there was a lot of fisticuffs, and we were told just leave them alone because they have really been through some skirmishes. And uh, during that time, when we got there, shortly after the large Battle of Quezon erupted, and we had a radio net. I'm getting a little ahead of myself mm -hmm. there, but uh, you know, here comes the news and the Armed Forces paper. And uh, President Johnson says, I want you men to dig down a foot deeper every day. Now that's, so, you know, that's the real world. That's what we were exposed to, the farther north we went. So it scares the heck out of you, you know. Now, uh, what actual duties were you performing at this point? Okay, uh, well, once I got to Fubai, from Anke, mm -hmm. we flew up to Fubai at night. And uh, they had a promotion board up and you could go up if you wanted to. Well, like I said, I had my college done, it was a little older, and uh, there were 10, there were five uh, stripes coming down. That was a spec four. Mm -hmm. And uh, another fellow from Chicago and I tied for first. So we got awarded that. Um, so I actually, I was a Sergeant E5, but I, my MOS, was a radio operator. Well, now I became a chief radio operator, and then you're in charge of people. So, mm -hmm. and that was good and bad. So, uh, but uh, that's what I did. I manned a radio for a while, and then uh, I actually manned a radio net. But at in, in Fubai, the I Corps Tactical Headquarters was there, and I lucked out. I got go down, and I uh, had an office job in an air-conditioned bunker. Tile floors, go down the tunnel, uh, radio maps all over. Um, 
Colonel this, all that, you know, you had to be very careful. And then, of course, the general would pop in once in a while and they'd scare the daylights out of you. And uh, so that, that was my duty. And uh, I could tell you a lot of stories about that. But uh, um, so, uh, we, let's see, now what were your, otherwise, your, your, sort of your, your physical living conditions like there? Um, they fed us uh, okay. Uh, the main menu for uh, several weeks, because they couldn't get supplies to us, uh, was mutton. Mm -hmm. And I just detest that to this day. Uh, I would walk into the uh, mess hall and mutton, because the NCO, you could go ahead of the mm -hmm. line, and I said, you know what, I'm going to get a hamburger at the club. I'm sick of this stuff. It just was greasy old mutton. And uh, anyway, so, but otherwise, they, they fed us pretty well. Um, our mess hall was close, uh, the company street, everything was dirt, bunkers were already built, and um, you had to be a little careful because you had big rats in the bunkers or snakes, and uh, yeah, you know, but that was day to day, and I would walk to my duty station, uh, we worked 12 on, 12 off, uh, seven days a week, and uh, never got a chance to go to church or anything until I kind of learned the ropes a little bit. But that was, that was my life. All right. And then when you're on duty, what are you actually doing? Uh, basically every hour I had to contact the other members that were on this net. Mm -hmm. Dong Ha, Quang Tree, The Rock Pile, Camp Carroll. Mm -hmm. These were all ones and I'd, uh, I'd uh, actually use voice mode through a secure box, mm -hmm. scramble it and mm -hmm. uh, they'd get it. And uh, lots of times uh, at night the operators would go to sleep and you couldn't contact, so I had to log that in and mm -hmm. of course with the general staff around there, I didn't dare sleep, you know. Yeah. Well, there was a friend of mine I made from the Air Force, a Spec 5, and uh, we kept each other awake, see. All right. Uh, now, on the base itself, did you have uh, either Vietnamese military or civilians doing anything? No, we didn't have Vietnamese, but we had civilians. Uh, they took over as KPs, and that was nice because KP in Vietnam was tough. I mean, yeah. it was so brutally so, hot. Were these Vietnamese civilians? Vietnamese okay. civilians, yes. But you didn't have Vietnamese military? Was, no, okay. no, they were, uh, they were somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, yes, but they, they would drive through the camp and uh, they would be walking around and uh, yeah, that's, uh, and they had a Vietnamese barbershop on base. Now, did you have concerns about any of the Vietnamese civilians being VC or anything like that? Well, not really, uh, but you were told to keep an eye out for certain behaviors, and there was one fella, I was sitting on top of uh, the bunker, and this was huge for a while, taking a break, and I see him counting steps, and uh, I, right away I called our orderly room, and they called the MPs, and they arrested him. He was pacing off the distance from the motor pool to the core headquarters, mm -hmm. and uh, See, we were sitting ducks, you know, the, the, it appeared that they either were going to hit the airport, which was right across the street, or the signal, and guess what, we were, see? So that's why we were all downstairs, and we experienced a, a number of rocket and mortar attacks, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, when the attacks came, I just, would you just get a few shots or a larger barrage? Or? Uh, just a few. They would walk the mortars in, and, you know, they'd shoot one, click, shoot one, and so on, and they'd walk them in and walk them out. Uh, the rockets came sporadically, and when they came, it was like an earthquake, and uh, uh, I lost a friend, uh, the friend who was with the Air Force. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a Spec 5, his last, I can't even remember his first name anymore, but he and I were uh, on duty and uh, yeah, we, I'd watch his radio if he went to the latrine or I did. So uh, I said, well, hey Green, your turn to go. So he did. And he was killed by a rocket, a chunk of shrapnel, that big went right through me and he never came back and I said, something screwy. So uh, I said to the uh, Major, Major Carrillo, decent guy, he was from one of the general staff. I says, Green, what? And he's out of law. And he says, you don't want to know about him. He says, he died instantly in the latrine, which is so, mm -hmm. uh, some people say as fate would have it, I was spared. Uh, I, I believe in God's providence and uh, wasn't my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Now, as far as you can tell, were the uh, attacks necessarily well aimed, or were they just kind of lobbing them into general places? I think they were lobbing them. The mortar attacks were pretty well, but uh, but the rockets they had uh, what they called area accuracy, mm -hmm. which made they want to, you know, they'd hit somewhere in Byron Center here, but right. uh, they would never hit your house or. What? Yeah. Even the mortar attack, if they're walking it, they're controlling it from where they're shooting it from, oh, not yes. necessarily correcting fire for misses or something. No, they like just that. keep walking yeah. them in on a straight line, mm -hmm. and, and one night, um, see, we had a generator trailer next to our barracks, or hooch, we'll call it hooch, and they were walking them in, and of course, you know, the first one hit, and what was that, and, and you're going to get out of bed, and the next one hit, and it hit. One of the cross members of uh, a tarp support on the trailer, and it went off, and so the shrapnel went up above us. Some of us got well. Um, I got I get hit in bed. I was lying in bed, hitting the shoulder and the hair, and then uh, a couple of the guys. Uh, one guy from Indiana, one fireman from Iowa, and they uh, talked about uh, the next day. The first sergeant says, "Hey, you're eligible for a Purple Heart," and we just said. Uh, Dick and I said, uh, you know, what am I going to tell my grandkids? Grandpa, what's your purple? You know, you, I got it laying in bed, but the other guy, one of them took it, so that's fine. So, yeah, I was eligible, but yeah, you know, you know, you don't take, I can't take stuff like that. But mm -hmm. um, if it would have hit the ground, we would have got messed up pretty bad, but it didn't. So, anyway, we love to live to fight another day, as they say. Okay. Uh, now, uh, during what time span were you at Fubai? Was that full tour or did you move around? Well, no. Uh, see, uh, being that, that section or net chief, these I uh, had to go by helicopter to check or to communicate one-on-one -on -one with these radio operators because they were, they, were, they, were, they were that great and you know, reliable. So I uh, get in the general's helicopter and he's in there and then we go up to um, there was a camp called Jali where the 101st was, mm -hmm. and then we would go up to Quang Tree and Dong Han and over to the rock pile, Camp Carroll, mm -hmm. and then back, you see, and that was during the day, and that was wonderful because I didn't want to go at night because, you know, a chopper, you're a sitting duck, they can hear you coming from, and of course, you know, one of the, and we'd take off from outside the bunker where I was uh, working, there was a big helipad there. And you know, they, they, the helicopter rises and then they go like this. And my helmet rolled out the door. I said, forget it, you know. So, but yeah, every so often. So we had uh, radio stations, you know, but they were manned by the company of people who were there the mm -hmm. Marines or the 101st or, um, oh, I forget who was at Camp Carroll. But anyway, yeah, so I got around somewhat, yes. And uh, my last. I had, I had uh, a week to go, and you know, this is driving you nuts sitting there. And I went to my uh, CEO, I says, hey, you know, uh, I never caused you any hassle. And uh, I said, you know, there's a, a friend of mine from Granville. He was just a little kid, but I was his paper boy. I'd like to walk to see him. He's up at Jolly, you know, Camp Eagle, where I'm mm -hmm. 101st is. He gives me his keys. He says, I'll bring her back by child. So I took off, drove up there, didn't even take a weapon. Well, I had a sidearm, I had a, a 45. And uh, I pulled up to the uh, camp and I said, uh, the early room, do you know where, uh, do you have a mullograph working here? Yeah, Pete, he's in the uh, battery warehouse, battery shack, and I said, where is it, right over there? I said, well, you were just a little kid, but I knew him, I wanted mm -hmm. to say hello, because I'm going home. And so I pulled up there, and I got in, of course, he had grown up, he had shoulders and <laughs> muscles on him, and I thought, Pete, you know who I am? Yeah, you're Larry. I says, he says, how long have you been here? I says, oh, several months, I'm going home next week, and then he started to cry. He just got there. But mm -hmm. anyway, you never forget those things, you know, it's like meeting a brother, you know? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, when you were flying from base to base, uh, did you yes. ever take any fire? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the helicopter, uh, but you got to remember, see, uh, if, it, if it's a gunship, this is just a two-door Huey, uh, it has uh, Gatling guns and cannons, it's got everything on. So, if we spotted that fire, you know, that ship would just simply tilt and look down and they would just, 
open up with those Gatling guns, mm -hmm. and uh, oh man, so uh, I think what we got was single individualized mm -hmm. fire. I don't think there was any machine gun shooting mm -hmm. at us that I remember, you know. Did the helicopters you were in ever get hit? Oh yes, but, but none of them ever went down because they never got hit in a vital area. Mm -hmm. I, th I think if you get hit in the jet motor, yeah. uh, then, then you're done. Yeah, and if they're just shooting at you with the AK-47 or something like that, less no, likely. No, we I was more scared of getting hit in the door, so I kind of mm -hmm. always hunkered near the center of uh, so, you know. Right. Um, were there particular sort of officers or people you were assigned to or went around with who made a particular impression on you? Well, um, yeah, our, our first CO when we got to Ancade, um, he fit in well with our company because we, have a, we had a lot of Hispanics from... Spanish Harlem, mm -hmm. and they were from the Dominican, you know, as a condition of their immigrating to the country, they had to sign up for the draft, so, and he could speak Italian, and he could speak uh, Spanish very fluent, so that helped him a lot, and a uh, pretty decent guy, uh, but he didn't have a lot of guts, well, then we got shipped way up north, they, they split our, our unit into three pieces and took all our good equipment from the states, and which I guess is normal, and then the CO I had at Fubai, he was a West Pointer, and he was sharp. And uh, we had to go through these classes, uh, you know, and they're, you know, history classes, that's crazy, you know. Well, nobody wants to teach them, so they get the NCO with probably the lowest seniority, or uh, they get the NCO with, uh, sometimes we say lowest mentality, so, you know, he's given us so, you know, we're looking at each other, and I had a friend from uh, um, oh, from California, Oakland, and he, uh, you know, so he raises his hand. He says, uh, "This George Washington, now, uh, was he Democrat or Republican?" And of course, you know, you're just being a smart, you know. And uh, the class was done, and back in the room, the CEO was waiting for both of us. He said, "Don't you ever do that again." You know, or you're going to be cleaning the grease strap. You know, here E5, he says, you will clean it. And he says, I'll have a strike for you. And uh, So anyway, but no, I had, I had good uh, first sergeants, but see, I was a little older, a little more mature than the rest of them. And they recognized that rather than, uh, you know, the guys that hung out all night. And uh, if I did that, I couldn't get up the next morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was no way I was going to interrupt my service. I was going home on the day that I was uh, supposed to. So. Right. Now, over the course of the time you were in Vietnam, did you get any R&R time, either in-country or out of it? Um, I, I wasn't... I had a hard time getting it when I did. I got four days to go to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So I wrote my dad, I said, I'm not too flush, and he sent me a hundred dollars, and I think I, uh, at Da Nang, where uh, the pay came from, I went here and I got another hundred dollars advance pay and because I was sending all my money home mm -hmm. to my wife and child. And uh, so I was there for uh, four days, you know, and it was okay. I think uh, I was going to even have a tailored suit, you know, you could get them for a song, but I, I just, I, I got to save my money to mm -hmm. take them home, you know, so anyway, but yeah, I, I did that. Uh, the convoy duty I was on, that that got me out of there, uh, and everybody says you're crazy because if you know if you get attacked, you may not be even going home. So, uh, okay. convoy duty. Talk about that a little bit. Okay, convoy duty. Well, uh, I was had about two weeks to go. I was short, as the term goes, and uh, I had to get out of there. So you know, I go up to the CEO and say, Hey, you know, I never paid you any hat. I always done, but you've never been late. And uh, well, he says you can go, but I think you're crazy. So uh, they would convoy daily from Fubai down to Da Nang, pick up supplies and bring them back. Well, it's a beautiful mountainous road, winds right along the coast, and there was a place called the High Van Pass. And it's way at the top, and anybody who's driven the road will recognize that. And, you know, it keeps giving away. So, um, you know, they have a big steel plate with a railroad uh, track welded on on one side and so here I'm going and I'm not driving but I'm looking down and there's about that much room between our tires and that rail track and if we go over man we're going to go a thousand foot down so yeah it was kind of scary there was a lot of anxiety there 
But uh, we got to Da Nang, loaded up, uh, went to the USO, got a hamburger, a real live hamburger and french fries, you know. Haven't had one in months, you know. You, you'd give $10 for a Big Mac in those days. But um, so, uh, yeah, and, and of course, accompanying the convoy, they had five-ton five flatbeds with a quad 50 machine gun turret on it. And of course, if they saw a puff of smoke or anything, they would open those up and just obliterate the scenery. Um, and, but the road was maintained by the engineers. And they slept in a drain culvert along the road, and they had an M60 and a bulldozer. And I, boy, I will never want to be an engineer. That was the first engineer's brigade, you know, three guys, and with a little uh, prick 10 radio, we called it. And I talk about being out in the middle of nowhere. It's a, that is not for me. So I convoyed once. That was enough. Uh, scared me enough. Yeah. All right. Uh, you mentioned sort of the USO down in, in Da Nang. Did the USO come out to Fubai or these other places? Oh, yeah. They would, they would put shows on, you know, and, uh, oh, you know, you're, you're seeing American girls. You know, and they're singing and dancing, you know, and they, they could be the ugliest gals that you ever seen, but they all look good then, I'll tell you, you know, and the short skirts, the mini skirts were coming in, which was quite a shock to us, you know. We would, and uh, so they did come out, and that was a welcome break. And uh, we had the Bob Hope show one time, and that was so he's, he was his usual crazier than a bed bug self, you know. Uh, but yeah, then uh, I'll bet you there was like 5,000 men just sitting there in the hot sun, and uh, we enjoyed that. Yeah, they came home. Okay. Well, you mentioned the mini skirts. You sort of mentioned sort of thing, things changing at home. I mean, you're in country, you know, kind yes. of through 68, where there was a whole lot of stuff going on. Oh, to what extent did you become aware of things going on back home while you well, were all there? One of the biggest things um, I noticed is the attitude of incoming replacements. Uh, things change back home, you know. You had Walter Conkright, and every night there were so many more hundred killed, and it kept going. And the tide was turning, and you had the demonstrations taking over universities. And then uh, Martin Luther King was shot. And this, and for three days they played very soft music, because there was there were some real racial tensions, and we didn't cause them, but or the perception was, and uh, you know, I. I uh, it was, uh, that made, I said, boy, what in the world? And then a few months later, you know, I'm going on duty to relieve one of my guys for Chow, and he was from Missouri, and he was a worshiper of uh, Bobby Kennedy, and I says, Clark, it's, I just heard on the radio, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. No, no, don't give me that jive. I said, Clark, it's true, get your radio on. He says, what is happening? And that's what we got, you know, a lot. Uh, some of the letters, Nancy would send me uh, newspaper clippings and, uh, oh, uh, but things were changing. Uh, you know, we I think we went there with an, uh, to try to attempt a military victory. Well, that all changed in 68, and Cronkite saying, hey, we got to get out of there. And here I'm there, and I'm thinking, oh, nice, thanks a lot, you know. But, uh, yeah, things changed uh, politically. And the attitudes here in 68, and we notice that on troops coming in, very insubordinate. You tell them what to do, and they refuse to do it, and they, the attitude is, well, what are you going to do, send me to Vietnam? I'm already here. So, you know, uh, things changed a lot. Yeah, we notice that right away. Okay. Now, how would you rate the actual performance of your unit or the part of it that was around you over the course of that time? Were you getting your job done? Oh yeah, we, we were accomplishing uh, our job. You know, we we had a pretty decent uh, signal corps. Guys are pretty decent. Um, you know, they're usually uh, they through testing they pick out the top ones. And uh, you know, uh, the reason they stuck me in radio school is I had a good intonation. Mm -hmm. You know, I could recognize sounds. And we had in our company a number of guitar players, and they took it with them. And uh, well, so we sang a lot at night. And, you know, put some steaks on the grill, and uh, yeah. Now, when you got 
but of course you're on a whole rotation system, so yes. the guys are kind of going in and out to some extent on their own calendars. Now, your company went in together as a group, so then yes. did they have you then leave in sort of staggered batches, or what did they do? Um, when we got to Oncade, we thought we were all going together. Well, they split us in okay. three groups, and one group, a third of them went up to Fubai, and that mm -hmm. was my group. Mm -hmm. One of them stayed back by Oncade, and, and the, uh, there was another group that went to a place called uh, Chulai, I believe. Yeah, south of Da Nang or Kuchi or something. Right. But you had, uh, but then with your unit though, were there a bunch of guys there who were all going to finish at the same time you did, or were you now kind of spread out and mixed in with other guys? Um, initially, everybody was there, but later on, and uh, you know, this one would leave, that one would leave, and yeah, it started happening, you know, and I just couldn't wait till November 4 because that was my call a D-Ross day, Dave expected to return from overseas and uh, oh yeah, everybody was certain to leave and uh, but you had, you made new friends, new ones were coming in but they were green as grass, you know, and uh, Now when the new guys came in, I mean, were they, did they all really learn to do the job too? I mean, did they perform effectively or were they yeah, just not? They, they were trained very well, okay. but you see, you know, we were in a non-combat role, mm -hmm. see. So when you're talking about guys being insubordinate and that sort of thing, you're referring to other units? Well, no, in, in our unit, we, but you see, we were the radio platoon, kind of the cream of the crop, if I may say so. But then we had gener generator mechanics mm -hmm. and motor pool, and it's, it's just a different variety and qualifications. And uh, uh, our first sergeant, when there was one insubordinate, and he said, Listen, fella, I've been through Korea, and you're doing it. And he pulled out his 45 and locked and pointed it at him. And the next day, he was gone. This first sergeant was. Mm -hmm. He was gone. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, he, he kind of cracked, yeah. So we got a new first sergeant, pretty decent guy. But that, that's what happening. The older soldiers couldn't handle their recruits, the rebellious mm -hmm. recruits. And, uh, you know, uh, oh, I, I uh, you know, I was with, in marketing before I got drafted, and you learn to work with people, you know, say, hey guys, you know, I don't want to be here neither, you know, but, uh, you know, while you're here, let's get the job done, you know, we can do it the, mm -hmm. the chicken wire, we can do it just all pulled together, so, you know, you, you had to sell that every once mm -hmm. in a while, yeah. But that approach mostly worked? Uh, for me it did, you know, but uh, you try to get the respect, say, mm -hmm. hey, I want to go home just as bad as you are, and I have a young son at home that I have never seen. Well, uh, we had a greenhorn uh, from Detroit, and uh, he got assigned to guard duty, and I was uh, sergeant of the guard that night. So we're on the perimeter, and uh, we had a fellow from Arkansas, I won't mention his name, but he was a wisecracker, and he was, uh, he was a six-year man. And he was out beyond the guard post and the perimeter, and uh, he started picking up rocks and throwing them, landing in front of the guard. Well, what are you supposed to think? Is it a grenade or not? So this young greenhorn challenged him with a challenge where he didn't answer back. So we shot him right in front of me. And uh, talk about catching everything. We had to. CID and everything, and uh, he and I were uh, barricaded. They had to bring us chow. They didn't want us to talk to anybody. And uh, that, uh, I will never forget that, and they wanted me to accompany the body bag, but you know, he had a little hole in the front, and his back was blown open that wide. They had three kids at home from Arkansas, you know. Mm -hmm. You never forget those things, see. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, you know, inexperienced. You probably never should have been out there, but uh, that was not my decision, and I tried to keep them by me, you know, mm -hmm. but you can't watch everybody. And the fellow throwing rocks? In well, he was just wisecracking, you know, yeah. like, you know, he was trying to scare you, like it was, well, that's what, they, they will toss grenades in once in a while to you on the perimeter, mm -hmm. and he did that, and everybody got scared, and, they, you know, the, the, the adrenaline started pumping, and, uh, um, you know, he stood up and he was challenged, and uh, he did. He should have gave the word to answer mm -hmm. that, but he didn't. So the young recruit, he did what he was trained to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, oh yeah, that was uh, right. Yeah. Uh, now 
you mentioned before you talked about uh, Martin Luther King being killed. Yes. Uh, what kind of racial climate was there on the base? Um, we had, uh, for us, for ourselves, our company and battalion, it was very good. Hey, we were just uh, straight up, you know, and uh, it was never a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the toughest thing is we had a promotion board and some of us were promoted and the one Afro-American was not. Mm -hmm. And he was really sore about that, but he didn't fulfill it. I mean, it was an honest test and he honestly failed it. But that was hard to swallow in those days, right after Martin Luther King, you know, he yeah. says, he says, I'm here fighting for my own country and they don't even reward me for it. Mm -hmm. and so we had to talk to him and he, he was an athletic director at a school in Oakland, California, you know. Uh, this was not a greenhorn. And yeah. I said, well, Mac, you just got to, hey, take it as it comes. We got five months and we're going home. And yeah, yeah, you know. But he says, it is no different here than it is back home. So, uh, but in terms of racial tensions, we had a battalion of Marines move next to us in tents. And the first sergeant, a wise old guy, says, you're waiting in line at the PX, they cut in line, just let them go. And they were mainly Afro-American mm -hmm. Marines. Just let them go, don't hassle them, they've been through hell, and uh, I just um, let them go, mm -hmm. you know, and that was good advice, because they were, they were wound tired in the drum. And after a while that cooled down, mm -hmm. you know, but then when Bobby Kennedy got shot, it started, it started right up again, see? So it, it ebbed and flowed the racial tension, but okay. uh, not a whole lot of that. All right. Now, was there much of a problem with drug use on the base? Oh, it was all over the place. You know, uh, some of the guys, see, we worked 12 on, 12 off seven days a week, and one guy, you know, before he'd go to bed, we go have a light breakfast, because if you have a heavy breakfast, you'll never sleep. And I couldn't find it. Well, I knew where it was. There was a drain culvert and green smoke coming out of it. He was smoking weed in there. And, mm -hmm. and some of the guys would get heroin in the village, and it was so powerful that they would take this and put it on their menthol cigarettes and smoke it. Oh yeah, it was running rampant and uh, the pill bottles and uh, somehow I just, uh, yeah, you know, I was a little older and it wasn't a victim of that stuff. You know, I had to save my money a good Dutchman, you know, and send it home. See, yeah. How much do you think it affected operations on the base? Um, in our platoon, I don't think it affected it that much because, you know, the word gets around, it, you know. I wasn't born last night, you know. Uh, but in some of the other platoons, uh, mechanics, generator operators and that, yeah, see, uh, they, were, they were really into it because, you know, they basically could go work on a truck, crawl underneath and, mm -hmm. and lay there all day and nobody's going to hassle them, see, well, they, you know, they take their uppers or downers and, uh, oh yeah, it was, uh, it was running rampant where I was, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the beetle nuts and all, yeah, all kinds of stuff. All right. Uh, how much of a gap or, or division did you sense between sort of the essentially rear area guys, people who got to stay on base, and the combat troops who were going out in the field and back to these fire bases? Uh, not a whole lot because we really didn't come in direct contact with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not in R&R &R area or where you rest in that. Mm -hmm. that, that was further up north by uh, Camp Eagle, mm -hmm. Jolly and the Quang Tree and all that. We were, our area was, there was a lot of permanent bases, a big tele, uh, telecommunication center, mm -hmm. uh, a big motor pool and uh, the I-Corps headquarters, you know, well, um, anything that went on would be snuffed up right away mm -hmm. by the uh, upper echelon. How much contact uh, did you have with uh, Vietnamese civilians? I mean, did you go off the base at all or something? Uh, no, and I had no reason to go off. Uh, we had one fella that, uh, you know, he was going to go to the bil uh, village looking for company. He got a haircut and the barber slit his throat. Mm -hmm. He never come back. And then, of course, uh, there, there was a lot of um, sexual transmitted diseases, you mm -hmm. know, and being a Dutch cut kid from uh, Western Michigan, that uh, that scared the daylights out of you, and you know you got to. I had to be faithful to my family. 
but people would go off the base for that. Yeah, but that, but not for very long because see, at night, you know, that the main gate, uh, the sappers would try to come through, and uh, you know, with their satchel charges, and uh, so uh, a couple fellows went into town, you know, and they eat at a restaurant, and they come back, they'd be sicker than a dog, you know. So it it just was it was a good place to ride through, mm -hmm. you know, because. We owned it by day, but at night, Charlie ruled it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, do you remember any of the sapper attacks themselves? Were you yes. ever, you know, can you yeah, tell me something I, I was, uh, I was in a bunker, kind of a rampart, you know, uh, sandbags or in a U shape. And uh, they got as far as the front gate and they were tossing them over. And uh, uh, yeah, they went off, but then the next day, uh, you know, uh, they would find them entangled in the barbed wire. But yeah, the sappers would come through. Uh, you know, I, I I have reason to believe they probably got higher in a kite than pot, and then they'd do a charge. You know, in the middle of the night. So yeah, it happened, but uh, they never got through. All right. Um, are there other sort of particular incidents or things that happened while you were there that kind of stand out in your mind that you haven't sort of brought into the story yet? Oh uh, well, it was uh, uh, April twenty-five. The runner came from the other room and said, uh, Sergeant Grotheis, you know, I had to get used to people calling me that, that there's a message for you in the early room from the Red Cross. Well, uh, so I had a healthy son. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, and then a couple times through the Mars stations, military affiliated radio stations, uh, I called home. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's 24 hours different, so I caught her right after supper one time. And uh, I don't know another time, but I, and then of course I said, hey, I'm here at such and such, and the, uh, the gentleman jumped right in, you can't say that. You know, they monitored every transmission, see, so, but you know, you had to talk, and my wife had to learn to say over after she was done mm -hmm. speaking, so those are memorable times. Um, another time I remember is I went on sick call, I had upper respiratory, infection URI they call it and I was down didn't feel good and I got permission to go to a little uh, kind of like a mash hospital in a tent and I walked in the tent and this is something and uh, I looked at that doctor and he looked at me while he was working on a child that got ran over by the military, uh, one of our trucks mm -hmm. and she was messed up pretty bad so I waited and waited and he says and then they put her uh, kind of in a room or on a bed and then I walked up there and and the guy you know uh, he was a, he had to be from Michigan or somewhere well uh, pink complexion freckles you know uh, there was a saying we had when kids well this guy got the map of Holland and the Netherlands on his face well I looked at his name tag and he said Hoekstra well okay he was a doctor from Wisconsin and uh, he come to me and he asked me the name of my denomination and I said, yes, I am. And uh, well, he says, I'll stop by sometime and share with you. I says, when do you get off duty? He says, midnight. I says, stop by. I'm kind of in the valley right now after seeing this child, mm -hmm. you know, you uh, have strong Times when you're on the mountain with your faith, and times you're in the valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, he helped me a lot. Then that was, I'll never forget that. He passed away several years ago. He's from Wisconsin, but he married a Western Michigan gal. I can't even remember the doctor's first name, but uh, yeah, I, I'll never forget that. Dr. Hookster from somewhere in Wisconsin, probably one of those little Dutch towns, you know? Yeah. Now, did you, uh, you, you mentioned it. it when you were first there and doing the 12 on, 12 off, you wouldn't get a chance to go to services or things like that. Uh, eventually find well, until I knew the roops and then uh, this fellow that, uh, uh, he, he was from uh, Missouri and I said, well, he wanted to go and I said, well, let me go to the first one, you go to the second. So I did, of course, then this doctor was uh, mm -hmm. directing the choir and he says, nice to see you. Uh, I haven't seen you here much. I said, doc, uh, I, uh, I didn't really have much desire to go under these conditions. So uh, so I, I, I went a few times, but it was so unlike a home, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, and it's it's not like church back here. It's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, now you finally do kind of get to the end. Uh, let's yes. t take us back out of Vietnam. Yes. So you get you, your day comes up. I mean, do you wait and just check orders every morning to find out if you're going? Oh, no, I knew the date. I had uh, November 4. That was right. my D Ross date. Right. And uh, I'd come to the orderly room and uh, top first sergeant say, "Now come see me tomorrow." So I did. He got them all ready, and then yeah, you got to go see the chaplain. You got to see this one, that one, and of course, then they say, "And we'll offer you tax free six thousand dollars if you." re-up for six years, and I tried to be respectful. I said, sir, this was a CO. I said, I, I really, I got a family. I got to get back there. This this is not the life for me. And then he said, yeah, I know what you mean. So, But I processed them. Mm -hmm. The next day I left. Uh, flew uh, to Da Nang, and from Da Nang to Cameron Bay. In Cameron Bay, uh, we got on a plane. And some of the guys I was with through my whole military two years. Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, Whitmore, Whitmore Lake, somewhere down that Grass Lake. And uh, so we got to uh, Fort Ord, um, well, Seattle, Tacoma, right there. Well, Fort Ord is California. Uh, I'm not very, uh, Fort, Fort Lewis. Lewis. Yeah. Fort Lewis, yes, Fort Lewis. And uh, it was uh, getting uh, well, on in the day and wait and wait and hurry up, and you get paid and you get an airline ticket. and you get this and that, and um, well, it was uh, probably close to 11 o'clock at night, and we could have stayed there, and I said, Larry, I'm going, and so this fellow from I, we grabbed a cab, and, and uh, he took his hat and threw it, because you had to be in uniform, he threw it right out of the cab's window, and uh, so anyway, we got to uh, their United Airlines, and uh, they said, hey, we got a, a flight leaving in 10 minutes, so I'll have to hold the flight for you to Chicago. And so we got to Chicago, it was a red eye, a real red eye, and I said, you know, I gotta call my wife to tell her I'm in country, because I didn't want to get out of my place in line mm -hmm. to miss a plane, so uh, I called her, I said, Mrs. Grodice, I'll be home in one hour. And she screamed, and uh, so uh, my in-laws and my parents were at the airport, and there I come off the plane, and uh, there's my six-year-old son, or six-month-old son. Okay, now this tape is about out, so I'm going to stop it right here. Shipping, when, when you got back to the States, and you had gotten back originally uh, into Washington, were there people telling you about things like, well, don't wear your uniform on the plane, or this kind of thing? It, it wasn't that bad back home. Mm -hmm. That came afterwards, when that ground swell of opposition, you know, uh, uh, I, I talked to old Vietnam mm -hmm. vets and they were spit on and they said, yeah. don't wear it, yeah. Well, some of it seems to be where you landed. Rece be. Reception was better at Tacoma yeah. than it was. Oakland, California, a lot of them went oh, through, but well, that, that, was, that was bad pretty early. That's a whole, yeah, well, everything starts in California, you know? Yeah, I guess so. So, yeah. but anyway, for the three of you, there was not really that, that much uh, of an issue as no, far as that. No, happened. we got off the plane at um, Fort Lewis, and we went right to a processing health center, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, got paid all the mustering out and talking about things mm -hmm. that you had to be debriefed as far as security issues and uh, hey, we took off and uh, there wasn't, an, I, if there were any demonstrators, I didn't see them because we ran from the cab to the airport inside and then we got to United's desk and uh, they said in 10 minutes so we yep. ran and uh, our luggage got in Chicago and, uh, and anyway, my friend from uh, Fort Lewis, he flew to uh, Oklahoma City and uh, I flew to Chicago, and that was it. Never heard from him again. All right. Now, what was it like to be back home again after a year in Vietnam? Oh, well, uh, I had a lot of support when I was in service. I got letters from a couple uh, ladies that are now deceased from Johnson, Michigan. Mm -hmm. One is Jean Nynice, and the other was... Uh, her last name is Westrate, and uh, just fun, constantly, and my dad-in-law tells me they did that to him during World War II. So anyway, but uh, I was fortunate. I was working for a good employer, and 
when I got drafted, before I left, he says, Larry, when you come back, your job will be waiting for you. Well, uh, at that time, I got back and uh, home for one or two days. Uh, some friends uh, nailed a great big cardboard sign in an apartment where we lived in Granville, right across from the Round Bank, and it said, Welcome home, Larry. And uh, of course, you know, you like to just spend home some time with your child mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, your wife, but the people kept coming over, and, and, and so, yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, but it took me about a week to really adjust, and I called my office, my employer, and he says, We've been waiting for you. Of course, that was good news because mm -hmm. you know things could have been otherwise. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I started right out. Uh, I, I goofed off the month of uh, November and uh, December. I started back to work at the same exact job I had with all the accrued benefits. So mm -hmm. they were very fair to me. Okay. I had I had good employers and uh, good friends there. Did you talk to people much about your experiences in Vietnam? No, Vietnam? I didn't want to. I had one customer in a little town of Blanchard, Michigan, and he was there at the same time, and we both knew it, and we just made a compact. We would never talk about it. Um, I kid now, but up till, I'd say the last five years, I, I can talk more about these things and not get too emotional, you know, mm -hmm. not, not angry, but just simply uh, crying, uh, sobbing. Uh, I think I'm over that right now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it's taken a long time. Uh, how much did you tell your wife? Not very much. Not very much. Oh, there was no reason to. You know, she still was that sweet, innocent gal from Western Michigan, and she had no need to know some of the the, the things I really went through. You okay. know. Uh, do you think you, you carried any either physical or, or mental baggage with you out of Vietnam? Uh, yeah, I carried some. You know, if if you say no, I didn't. Well, that's that's you're not being true to yourself. Uh, physical baggage, um, it became evident seven years ago that I was exposed to uh, Agent Orange mm -hmm. herbicide. And uh, a friend of mine directed me to the Veterans Administration and I went through the test. And uh, for my case, an Agent Orange, uh, they recognized it right away, never questioned it, tested, and they were they're taking pretty good care mm -hmm. of me. I, I can't complain about my treatment at the VA one bit, contrary to what you hear, you know. But, you know, I went there seven years ago, mm -hmm. and that's a little different now. They're just, they're just so crammed up, and uh, they're putting a new facility up here out in Byron Center near mm -hmm. Metro Hospital. So uh, that that's going to help. But there's such a backlog now. Yeah. When I went in. Um, I kind of breezed through it and they sent me to Battle Creek. And, uh, but no, I, I get some pretty decent care from the VA. Yeah, well, it's the sort of thing where if you're sort of on the right list and you're going in at the right time, it can work pretty smoothly and that's what it's supposed to do. Yes. Uh, there, on the other hand, if you've got a different diagnosis or different situation where you come in when there's too many coming in. Well, I'll see what's matter. happening. You see, you're getting the uh, Iran, well, Iraq, uh, yeah. Iraq uh, Afghanistan. Af Afghanistan, and all that. And, you know, these guys are coming back probably with no more baggage than what I had. But see, we are recognizing that. We're much mm -hmm. more educated about mental health than we were 40 years ago. So, oh, yeah, they're there. And see, the VA, they've got to get more people. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't, it isn't you know, they're, they're just overwhelmed, um, I believe, you know. That, that's what I can pick up. Now, of course, the other thing that's a little bit different now is that people are going for multiple tours. In Vietnam, yes. they relied on the draft. When I ranks. hit country, when I hit country, I knew that in one year I would be going home, and that was nice. But now, uh, you know, you're in service, so you're home for a year, and then they ship you back out to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's sort of creating a different set of stresses, I guess, in Vietnam. Yes. They, they actually said, you know, let's have the, let's not call up the car and reserves because we'll get it in hot water. And now it's, let's not have a draft. Yeah. But now they're paying the price because of the strain on the guard. And exactly. Reserve. Yeah. Exactly. So it's sort of hard to, to balance the, the, yeah. the, those two as far as that goes. Yeah. Okay. Now, now for yourself, if you kind of look back at the time that, that you, you spent in, in the service, um, what kind of effects do you think it had on you aside from, you know, the Agent Orange part? Um, Are you a different person or did you learn from it? Well, it was a tempering experience. Uh, 
like I said, I was a young Dutch kid out of Western Michigan to this culture here, and uh, you know, you uh, wised up fast. And uh, for my wife, uh, it was the same thing. Um, she got a job working in a grocery store in Fort Gordon, Georgia, you know, and, and you know, with uh, white bathrooms, colored bathrooms. I mean, in this day and age, I, I couldn't believe it, see? And, uh, <clears throat> oh, very uh, high discrimination. Uh, it was terrible. Well, uh, that's all changed now. So, uh, but it was a grow, and then she got a job working in a bank in Arizona. She never said she, she wouldn't want to work in a bank because she'd make a mistake and get caught at it, and uh, she loved the job. She's a very good bookkeeper, keeps good track of money. So, um, what effect did it have on me? It was a maturing experience. Most of my contacts, friendships, uh, acquaintances were from a certain culture. Uh, you know, I would feel very comfortable in Bayern Center, you know. But that caused me to have a greater appreciation of our country and also that just because people maybe went to a different Sunday school than you did, so to speak, they're wonderful people, see, and that was not the prevalent attitude of the culture where I come from and you could probably write a book about that, see. So uh, that changed me a lot. I think it strengthened my faith. Um, it caused me to doubt several times when I was over there. There were moments that I just said, you know, I wonder if God really exists. And if you say, if you say, oh, I never felt like that, you're not being honest with yourself, you know, you, and, uh, you know, but then, uh, you know, they're all, oh, God will take care of you. Well, uh, you get a few rounds flying over your head and you're going to take care of yourself too. So you, you learn fast, you become hardened to it. So, uh, yeah, that's in terms of changing, did it change us? So I think uh, it gave me and my wife an appreciation for those who are not as fortunate as we are. Uh, and that gives us uh, a heart to do our present work. We're involved in the disaster response work. Tell because, me a little bit about that. What kinds of things have you been doing? Well, uh, to give you the uh, whole nine yards, we are uh, members of disaster response of the Christian Reform World Relief Committee, which is right over on 76th Street. And we uh, started out uh, as workers, and we're still workers, but uh, we actually became site managers, so we're responsible. But, but we do interviewing. We do needs assessment and say our heart is in that because I've seen so much uh, destruction and suffering. You know. Where have you gone? Oh, uh, Jim, I can't remember it all, but mm -hmm. we've probably been to the Gulf a dozen times. We've been to Florida once, we've been to North Carolina, mm -hmm. we've been to Washington State, mm -hmm. to California, wherever there's a disaster. And I have a feeling we're going to be going down to Alabama and to Joplin, Missouri, as yeah. soon as we let them do that. Right. Uh, so, but there's such a need. So that's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rather fulfilling. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate. Um, my employer allowed me to uh, buy into the company. Uh, he died at an early age, so his wife sold it to us. And I was fortunate at the age of uh, 50, well, in 1997, I could walk away with a mm -hmm. nice contract paying mm -hmm. me off, and they treated me very well, mm -hmm. uh, very fair, no complaints whatsoever, because everybody said, oh, yeah, they'll give you a year's payment, and then after that, the payments will stop. Well, um, that was, I, I guess maybe it was a rarity, but I, I had good people mm -hmm. uh, working with me there. So um, we said, well, uh, we're not going to rust out home. And she continued to work for two years. And mm -hmm. for the first year, I goofed off, you know, I had a pickup truck and a cabin up north and deer hunting and bow hunting and all that. But then we got serious. So then uh, I went to see the organization and uh, 
talk to their uh, director, Andy Reiskamp, and then the next uh, week he called, how'd you like to go to Turkey right after the earthquake? So I did, and on this destruction. And then while you're there, we're going to send you to Kosovo because the war had ended. Well, that's all overseas work and quite a, uh, uh, quite some experiences, but I'd rather just stay right yeah. in the good old USA. I'm not a foreign traveler. See? Mm -hmm. But that, that the Vietnam experience, I think has given us a heart for that, you know? Um, I take a lot from the society uh, for many years in a business that run very well, uh, and now it's time to pay back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of my, that's our feeling right now. So what did, where did that come from? Uh, I've experienced suffering and death firsthand, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I get up every morning and say, thank you, Lord, for another day. All right. Well, it makes for a very good story. So thanks for taking the yes. time to tell it to me today. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. All right. And that is a wrap.